Today, we are talking with Matt Thornton about blue belts. Today, we are asking Matt Thornton five questions about blue belts. I know you have a lot of questions about them, and Matt is a great resource to answer those. So uh, I know you're going to enjoy the interview, and I hope you learned something. So here we go. All right, Matt, do you have any requirements for a blue belt? And if so, what are they? Absolutely, yeah. Um, when I first started teaching jujitsu about 25 years ago, it was, it was a, something to think about when I was watching my coach, Chris Howder, give out belts and you know how I wanted to evaluate people. And I realized pretty quickly that it's impossible, I think, and uh, impractical and unproductive to try and divide jujitsu up based by te in techniques. So I don't know if you remember, but some of the old books that came out from some of the Brazilian black belts back in the day had them, had the techniques divided by belt color. And you could, you could thumb to the part of the book that had a particular belt color. And I always found that ridiculous because some of the, um, some of the movements that, that they would show in the black belt portion would be things I'd show a white belt and some of the movements in, in the blue belt portion I would, I would see as things that weren't that fundamental. So um, anybody that's familiar with SBG methodology knows our focus is fundamentals, which we define as what's most important, not what what's most basic. The foundation of movement and making sure everybody can do those things properly so they have freedom of exp as much freedom of expression as possible. So when I'm teaching a room full of black belts or I'm teaching a room full of white belts, my lesson plan doesn't usually change. So having said all that, the only way to evaluate blue belts is based on performance. And at my own academy now, since I've been here in Portland for you know, over 20 years, there's a large group of blue belts. And so it's very easy when someone's coming up through the ranks and they're able to roll technically uh, back and forth and give game to the other blue belts, then they know they're approaching that level. The other students know they're at that level. The coaches know they're at that level. It's not something we have to guess at. And we do an Ironman and they're promoted. And the Ironman is more of a a ritual. It's not a test. It only becomes tricky when I'm occasionally visiting some of our affiliate locations. We have over 50. Um, actually, it's more than that now, but at least over 50. And I don't necessarily know those students as well. So when I go there, what I will do sometimes is just put all the white belts through a series of positions. So five minutes mount top, five minutes mount bottom, five minutes cross sides top, five minutes cross sides, etc. through all the different positions. And what I'm looking for is their reactions. Are they responding with fundamental techniques that are appropriate or are they trying to muscle their way out? Or is it obvious that there's certain positions that they're unfamiliar with? And that's how I do it. But there's no, you know, there's no amount of techniques they have to show me correctly. There's no written test. I don't have them demonstrate anything. It's all done alive, either against resisting opponents on the mat throughout the years as they're coming up or in a, in a test like the evaluation like I just described. For that method of test where you don't know the student quite so well, are you relying quite a bit on the coach that does know the student? I rely a lot on the coach, but it's also, to be honest with you, for blue belts, it's not that difficult. So, you know, I put them in inside the closed guard and see how their base and posture is. I put them on closed guard bottom and see how their fundamentals are. Open guard passing, open guard holding, cross sides top and bottom, you know, back control, all the different positions. And you know you can look at someone and see them responding against somebody who's fully resisting against them in those positions. And, and I can know whether or not, they, they actually have ingrained the fundamentals that I want to have ingrained in them at that level. It's pretty, to be honest, it's a, it's a fairly easy way to test for blue belts. It's, it's uh, it can be tiring if they're not used to that because doing positional sparring for what we call drilling, what most people call positional sparring for hours, sometimes an hour and a half uh, can be tiring, but that's a good test in and of itself because the best measure of your jujitsu is what's left when you're exhausted anyway. And uh, it's the same test, same um, standard for all the belts. The only difference would be the level of their training partner. So if I'm looking at somebody for a brown belt and that's not somebody I know really well, then I'm going to take somebody who I know is a solid brown belt or black belt and I'm going to put them on the other end of those positions and I'm going to make them drill all those positions while I, while I watch. And, uh, and that's kind of the measure that we use. Matt, how important is it for a student to be able to defend their belt? 
Well, you you know, you can be a black belt and still get tapped by a blue belt. <laughs> Sometimes uh, you make a mistake and or other students can have particular movements, uh, even if they're a lower belt, that they're really good at. So you can have somebody who has an overall game as a blue belt, but has a black belt arm bar from guard bottom, as an example. And if you get lazy or make a mistake, they'll catch you in that arm bar. So you know, one win or one loss doesn't uh, make a belt. When I when I give out my I, I can get, I can answer a lot of questions in one in one by describing what I do with my brown belt. So when I have one of my brown belts who I'm close to giving a black belt to, prior to giving them a black belt, I always have a personal conversation with them and I ask them about belts and I ask them how would you give out belts? How would you evaluate people? Because one of the mistakes I think instructors make in this art is they assume that because you can do it well, you can teach. Uh, Those are separate skills. If you can do it well and you can teach, then therefore you must be able to tell what belt someone else is. That's also a separate skill. And sometimes people don't know. So they'll evaluate people based on how long they've been a particular belt. We don't do that at SPG at all. You can be a blue belt for 20 years or uh, a year, depending on, you know, how well you go up or they'll do it based on one performance. And the worst way to evaluate people is how well they do against you. That's a big ego trip that a lot of black belts get into, you know, this purple belt or caught me with a triangle he must be a black belt because there's no way i'd get i'd get promoted by i'd get uh, submitted by a purple belt then all of a sudden they throw the guy a brown belt uh and that's just a big ego trip and that's a mistake too so the only real measure of someone's performance and, uh, and what belt they are is how well they do consistently against their peers who are are that belt right that's that's the only way to really do it honestly and and really tell and when you have a group that's trained together for a long time and there's various belts in the room, then it's fairly easy to know if somebody is that belt or not, because they're, you see them perform over weeks and months and it's no problem. So the trick there is when you're a young coach and you don't have that many people on the mat is making sure that first crop of blue belts and that first crop of purple belts and brown belts are really solid because those are going to be the people that everybody else uses as yardsticks as they're coming up through the ranks. That's going to be what they measure against. And so I always, I always uh, caution my younger black belts that their first crop of belts that they give out, they should really, I'd rather see them wait too long than give it too early um, because that's going to be the measuring stick from that point forward for everybody else. That's interesting, especially with the, the first crop of them set in the standard for that location. Right. Really important. Matt, do you factor in intangibles like – uh, is the person a good teammate or do they have a positive attitude? Do they help others in the gym uh, when making a decision to give somebody a blue belt? Well, if they're, if they're not, if they don't have a positive attitude, they're not helping other people in the gym. We usually get rid of them anyway. <laughs> so it's not really a matter of the belts. It's like, we, we don't want them in the club. So, you know, the biggest mistakes I've made over the years, I've made a million mistakes over the years. And since I started teaching quite a while ago, you know, there wasn't that many of us around and, and it was kind of new and, and uh, we were learning as we went. And I'd be the first to tell you, I made a thousand mistakes. But my biggest mistakes, the ones that I regret the most, revolve around people that I kept around too long in the gym that I should have got rid of. Because um, by the time word gets to me that they're rough or I start to realize, man, this person's just, you know, is, is just too much of a dick to be on the mat. They've already, you know, hurt or, or offended dozens and dozens of people. And, and those people will only come and tell you after they're gone. And that's, that's a lesson I learned many times. Um, and you want to keep people around cause we always, you know, I, ha- I have a, hold out a lot of hope that jujitsu as a vehicle for, for self-improvement is very powerful. And we always hope that sometimes people will come around and change. They usually don't. And so now we're pretty ruthless about getting rid of people if they if they're, demonstrating any kind of poor attitude at all. We just don't want them at the gym. I'm really very protective of that environment. I feel that that's my number one job as a head instructor is to protect that environment. So I don't think they'd ever make it to blue belt in my academy or to where we'd even be considering them for blue belt in my academy if they had a bad attitude. Matt, you've mentioned that you've made mistakes. Have you ever given out a blue belt and regretted it? No, I, I only can think of one belt I've ever given out that I, I regret. And even then it didn't, it didn't really matter that much because it's something that they grew into. Um, and it was one of my very early higher belts that I just, you know, caved to a little bit of pressure. 
uh, based on my relationship with that person. But that's the only time. Every every time after that, every single belt I've given, all I've given out, I think uh, I have fifteen about black belts. They're all, you know, rock solid and uh, and uh, and the lower belts. I don't think I've ever given out one I regret it. No, and and when I'm especially when I, I should add to if I'm in Ireland or the UK or one of the other clubs, and I don't know the people there, and I and I I am doing the belt evaluations that I mentioned. If I see one major mistake, so for example, if they're caught in head and arm and they don't know how to escape a headlock properly, and or they're mount bottom and they're just trying to bench press people off. I'll put a check mark by their name, and no matter what else they do good that day, they're not getting their belt. So I'm pretty ruthless about handing out belts. If someone gets a blue belt from me, no matter where I am in the world, uh, it was they can rest assured that they should be able to go to any tournament and defend that belt in their age group and uh, an appropriate uh, weight category because uh, it, uh, it's a responsibility I do take pretty seriously. Do you think with your system of – uh, evaluating belts is harder. Is it focused more on on defense and what they're doing because they're sparring with their peers that are closely matched? It's oftentimes hard to show your offensive tools to somebody who's a similar skill with you. Yeah, no, it's not. I wouldn't necessarily. That's a good point. I wouldn't necessarily categorize them though as as defense as opposed to offense as I would positional as opposed to a uh, submission. So what, what I'm really looking for is their mastery and control over positions, and that includes escaping positions, and that includes holding positions. And and for us at the academy, like I said, everything in SPG is about fundamentals. And as you know, the core of fundamentals in Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, rests on the premise of position before submission. Uh, and and the, the thing that I've always found the least important and the least interesting about jiu-jitsu is submissions. So our focus is always on positions and I've always found the best jujitsu to be what most schools think of as white belt jujitsu. When we're talking about technical stand ups and uh, upas from mount and the appropriate way to apply weight when you're across side to top. I was just watching a video the other day of Hiran training some police officers and one of our other black belts posted and you can see him tapping those guys out with just cross side pressure from top. That's that's white belt jujitsu. That's that's nothing fancy. But to me, that's the most important part of the art. So um, when I'm looking at people, I'm not evaluating how good they can submit somebody, how fast they can submit somebody. I'm looking at how well they can control positions, including their ability to defend them and escape them and hold them, because that's going to be the foundation that allows them to grow a solid game as they move up through the ranks. Do you have any advice for the new blue belt? You know, I get asked that. That's probably my number one question. I get asked when I do my seminars every year, and, and I, um, I, I appreciate that. But people are always interested. You know, what do I need to do? Or as it's usually phrased, what what's the best advice for a white belt to get the blue belt? My answer is usually the same. It depends, obviously, on who I'm talking to. But the most often given answer is relax. Uh, that was the advice that was given to me when I first saw Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and took my first lesson. However, many. Decades ago, that was with Fabio Santos. He told me that. Hickson told me that. Uh, Chris Howder told me that over and over again. The years, um, you know, he trained me through my all my belts, and uh, that's what I tell the students. The sooner they relax uh, physically, then the quicker they're able to feel that connection to their opponent, as Hickson would say, and the, the better their technical jujitsu will become. And I always try and remind the students when I'm doing the belt evaluations. I'm not there as a strength and conditioning coach. I'm not interested in how how much they can bench or how powerful their squat is. I'm looking at their technical jujitsu, so they could be very strong and you know capable at the blue belt level of you know ripping somebody's head off or arm off their body. Uh, but if I see them responding in a way that's uh, technically poor, I'm going to fail them whether they win that match or not, because I know when they go down to the Pan Ams or they go down to the Worlds and they try and compete even at the blue belt level against the other athletes, once they get past the first couple matches, they're going to lose because everybody's strong and fast down there. You have to be strong and fast and have the appropriate technique. So my advice to the students is always relax. Follow closely by uh, don't worry about what belt you are. You know, Chris used to have the old school rule was if you asked um, how close you are to the next belt, you automatically had to wait another year. I don't do that, but I do remind them that you know, eventually they're all going to be black belts as long as they don't quit. 
and then you'll never get another belt, so don't worry about it. And then the last piece I would say to him, which is a technical piece, is I think it's really important, I always have, um, since I've taught, to begin right away with open guard and to focus heavily on open guard, especially through white and blue belt, because there is so much hip movement involved in being able to play open guard. Uh, and hip movement is the number one skill, as we all know, in jiu-jitsu. So if they focus too much on closed guard at the early belts, then sometimes they lack that hip movement and they're scared. You'll see them in the tournament. They'll be scared to open up their legs and go for anything. And so for strategically, for a lot of my students, I prefer they focus more on offensive closed guard later in the game, purple belt and beyond. It doesn't mean we don't work it. It just means that I try and get them to open up their guard as quick as possible and to attack as much as possible. Um, and that helps to get all that fluid hip movement and timing with the opponent, which is so important. And you want as many hours of that as possible. So you might as well start day one white belt. As a blue belt, is there a certain guard that you recommend uh, that they open guard that they start working with or just kind of try them all? Uh, we don't get too uh, defined that way usually. So they're going to be exposed to different guards. The coach might be teaching a daily heba guard or a spider guard and the different fundamentals of the grips and where you put your feet. But it, the way we teach open guard at SPG is more conceptual. So we'll talk about always having three points of contact, you know, two hands and one leg or two legs and one hand. And when you have three points of contact, that person's going to have a almost impossible time passing. They pass when they only, when you have two points of contact or less. So, those points of contact change. It could be your knee. It could be your foot. It could be butterfly hook. It could be a foot on the bicep. Your, your hands will take grips on the collar, grips on the sleeve, grips on the ankle, grips on the neck, grabbing the wrists. So those are all fluid. And then every single person on the mat is going to have a different open guard. Even at blue belt, they're going to have a different open guard. So uh, as much as possible, we focus on the fundamentals and we focus on, on conceptual foundations of the position and we let the students pick um, what they want to play. And by pick, I don't mean like it's an all you can eat Chinese buffet and they pick what dish they want. I mean, their body picks, which guards work best for them over hours on the mat. And you're going to have some blue belts that have these butterfly hooks and other blue belts that play spider guard and other blue belts that like to play, you know, deep half or whatever it is. And that's important, too, because what happens is you get a lot of diversity on that mat, and so everybody on the mat gets exposed to a lot of different games. And uh, I always know when I go to – if I go to a, a school to teach a seminar that's not an SBG school, um, I, I always know that they're probably not um, applying the best teaching methodology. When I look around the room and I see all the students playing the same kind of guard and trying to do the same kind of passes – and executing the same kind of sweeps. And what that means usually is the instructor at that school teaches his game or her game. Uh, they teach it on technique by technique basis. You do X, they respond Y, you follow with Z. And uh, it's a terrible way to teach jujitsu because in a room full of 100 people, you'll be lucky if you get two that are even similar after five or six years. And so um, we try not to do that. Instead, I said, this, these are the important concepts behind holding any kind of open guard. These concepts transcend the types of open guard. Here's what they are. Here's some drills so you can play it and develop those skills. Now go on the mat and develop your own guard. Figure out what works for you. Wow, that, that's great. And I could just visualize as a room uh, full of similar grapplers, you're not getting the same variety of ex experience on the mat as you would with a team that has you know, 100 grapplers, 100 different games, and you're going to have to uh, have answers for all of them. And it helps you. Exactly compete with people you don't know exactly yeah you don't want them to run into a different kind of game the first time ever when they step on the mat into a tournament that rarely happens i mean it still happens of course but it rarely happens to our students just because uh there's such a wide variety of games in, in a typical spg academy all right well thank you matt i appreciate talking with you yeah, thanks, man. It's great talking to you again. I look forward to it. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Matt Thornton. I have five other interviews with other black belts, uh, Tim Sled, Bernardo Faria, Dan Koval, Henry Akins, and John Will, all asking them the same five questions you heard Matt answer today. It's good to get different perspectives on everything. So check those out. I'm sure you'll enjoy them. Like the video, comment down below with your opinions and anything you got going on, and subscribe to the channel. Stay sweaty, my friends.